Certainly, thank you. Um, Councillor Chris Holly. Present. Councillor Bridget Rowlands. Councillor Irene Mann. Bridget Councillor... has just come on. Thank you. Councillor Mary Jones. Present. Councillor Paxton Hood Williams. Good morning and present. <laughs> Councillor Peter Black. Yeah, I'm here. Councillor Peter Jones. Present, Emily. Councillor Philip Downing. Present. Councillor Linda James. Present. And Ben Smith. Present, Emily. And is there anyone I've not called this morning? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, that's it then. Item two on the agenda is declarations of personal and prejudicial interest. Any members? No. Any officer? Sorry, no. Chris, I have got my hand. Well, I did have my hand up. Yes, I've got one. Right. Item seven, Appendix C. Oh, yes. I have taken legal advice and I know it's uh, for information, but to err on the side of caution, uh, it mentions Hendra Royal and School. I'm a governor at Hendra Island and my granddaughter also attends Hendra Island. Similarly, I, there's um, Bishops and Comp here and I'm a governor of Bishops and Comprehensive, but I don't think we're making any decisions on it, are we? No. Uh, and I'm also governor of Pendra Hafford, but again, we're not making the a decision on this. So. The, the same as me, it's just mentioned in the, yeah. um, in, in, in the, in the, in the uh, text. The, the with Mary, the big difference is a granddaughter. Granddaughter goes there, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, then um, item three is a prohibition of whip votes and declarations of party whips. Okay, uh, item four is the minutes of previous meetings. Has anybody any issues with the minutes of the previous meetings? No? No. Pardon? No? Okay, yeah. all happy with them? Yes. Peter, you've got your hand up. Well, in terms of a matter arising, Chris, Yeah. Um, minute six, which is the feedback to Cabinet, if you recall, we submitted through you various points that we wish to raise mm. uh, concerning the uh, outline budget. And of course, it's noted in there that um, three posts in the natural environment sector, planning ecologist, biodiversity officer, and a climate uh, action officer. Yep. Um, these have only been funded on a, well, the, the first two on a part-time basis, and the third on a basically a point two basis at the moment. Um, and of course, I was requesting that all three be raised to full-time status. Um, and I'm disappointed that, uh, unless I've missed something, uh, the part-time status remains the case. I wonder if someone, Ben, perhaps was able to comment on that. Thank you. You, you are correct, Councillor Jones. That remains the case because the items considered by Cabinet and then subsequently by Council made only some modest changes to some very specific proposals and it therefore did not reflect any change as a result of those individual items that you refer to. Can I just say I find this disappointing, um, basically because I feel, oh, I feel that sorry, I feel that the environment is somewhat unrecognised, uh, and when one considers the importance of the both biodiversity and climate change emergencies uh, that not just we as a council but more globally we're facing, I think it's disappointing that these posts. Uh, were, in my view, undervalued in the way that they are. I've looked in particular, for example, at the job description for the part-time biodiversity officer, and it's incredible that the level of responsibility, the range of tasks required of this officer, are, uh, I think, well beyond the capacity of a part-time appointee. Added to which I'm also concerned that as part-time appointments, I hope I'm wrong, but as part-time appointments, it may well be more difficult to recruit experienced and suitable staff to fill these roles. So I'm disappointed, Chair. Thank you. OK, Peter Black. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think uh, Peter's absolutely right. Um, I think the problem, of course, is that when you, 
making a comment like that within the context of a large budget debate, it does tend to get lost. So I was going to suggest that maybe Peter's um, panel might want to have a closer look at this and make a recommendation directly to Cabinet to see if they could find money within the budget to, to actually increase the, um, the scope of these posts. And that might be the way, a way forward. Thank you, Peter. I intend to do that, but thank you for your support. Thank you. OK. Right. Um, as I say, that that was the reply. We, we we sent off that and we haven't had a reply yet. When we have the reply, it will be worth noting that after that, then the comments we what you're being made now can then be added into that. OK, then we move oh. on to. Oh, sorry, Councillor Holly. Oh, sorry, I have got my hand up. Irene. It's Irene. Oh, sorry, sorry. Irene. Go no, not at all. Uh, good mo not at all. Good morning to everybody. Could I just support both Peters, Councillor Peter Black and Councillor Peter Jones? As a member of the um, environmental panel, I do feel the point that uh, Councillor Jones made is very valid and um, my huge support to his um, opinion there. Thank you. Thank you. OK, Ben. Yeah, Chair, could I come back in as well? I mean, again, I don't want to prolong it about the specifics and I understand entirely why Councillor Jones has raised it and it's right that he can take it up in due course. The point I would make is that um, the whole of the debate at Council last week was around reducing council tax. It was competing proposals for reducing income. There were no deliberations about spending more money. So it's just a general point I wanted to make that uh, whilst whilst it's right that individual bits are identified and it's right that the scrutiny process goes through and you continue to pick it up councillor jones it would be remiss of me not to point out that the will of council irrespective of differing views in the chamber was that overall council tax was being reduced and if you reduce your income you haven't got more money to spend not at budget setting but it's reasonable that as as councillor black has referred to that you can continue to explore other options for funding in due course well, just to point out, Ben, there was additional funding there for various other items like the recovery plan and what have you. And I can understand what Peter, Councillor Peter Jones is saying about the recovery should include the natural environment. But right. as you say, we'll take it up as well. Chair, can I clarify? Um, although the leader did refer to his recovery fund, that recovery fund was not in itself part of the budget proposals which were debated in Council. Mm. I understand that. It's just a question that there's that funding there. OK, then we move on to public questions. And I'm not sure we don't think we have any. Do we have em Emily? No public questions today, no. Thank you. Then we come on to the mid-year budget statement. Uh, over to you, Ben. Chair, with, with, with permission, can I combine items five and seven? Because one's about the mid-year update in terms of Treasury and the overall position, and one's the sort of following year one. So it makes sense. So we've, we've, and we've got the sort of third quarter sandwiched in between. So I, I think it might make more sense to take five and seven combined. Oh, you mean six, seven six, and eight? Yeah, sorry, six, I've got seven, two computers. Right? Six and eight, yes. Apologies, Chair. Yeah, OK. Six Is that and reasonable? Eight. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah, that, yeah, I think that's OK. And then we'll come back um, to the third quarter and do If that's the case, do you want to do um, item seven, which is the budget monitoring update? Because that that actually is, is a gone, is a document that is, has a his, is a history document where the other two are living documents. Yes, I think that makes sense. Apologies, Emily, I, uh, but I think I think the chair is quite right. It's probably best that I do item seven first by way of update, as as that, as you say, is retrospective for info, and then I do the other two. I will defer because I can see Councillor Jones has got her hand up. Yeah, Mary. It's only a question for Ben. I fully understand. I think we should do seven first, but the other two, they've already been through council and would have had the opportunity to be debated there. So I'm just wondering, are we just going to have an update or? You know, there's nothing really we can do. They're really just there for information. I'm just wondering, you know, the process really. Thank you. I, I, I think you're right in one sense. They have all been through, but in discussions with Emily, um, let's 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 be honest. Uh, there there was very little debate around the overall Treasury management stuff because it was one of the late items. And I think given that it has fundamental consequences for future years budgets and future years MTFPs all the way through to at least 25, 26, I still think there are avenues that the scrutiny panel may wish to explore. Even though you're absolutely right, it can't affect what's been through council in last week. 
So apologies for changing okay. the running order, but if you're content with that chair, then I will pick up item seven first, which is an update on the third quarter. And again, as I indicated at both scrutiny before you came yourself to cabinet and, and, and at council itself, it is an utterly movable feast. And I couldn't give you full updates because you had the scrutiny third quarter report, I think just the day before cabinet itself. I did go to cabinet and verbally updated on three updates which were that we were then in receipt of council tax funding in year of 2.6 million council tax reduction scheme funding confirmed at 0.7 million for the year um, up to then we'd only had 0.3 of a million for the half year so we were waiting the third quarter but we've also been given the fourth quarter sum um, in quarter th in quarter three we'd submitted our loss of income claim to the welsh government we, we at the point of writing the report and at the point at which you were considering stuff we hadn't received a reply we got a reply on the 14th of february notifying the position so it was just coming in at about the same time as we were considering the proposals at cabinet um, which confirmed that we would get 2.2 million pounds worth of loss of income for the third quarter um, which all was all wrapped up in my officer advice. We have now submitted our fourth quarter income claim and the fourth quarter income claim is an odd one because of course all of the others throughout the year have been claims in arrears. Welsh Government have conceded that because we have to do our accounts quickly, we have to do an indicative claim for the fourth quarter. Our indicative claim for the fourth quarter is over five million pounds further. So that one is a new item compared to even what I'd updated to cabinet on the 18th. Whether we get the full amount, we'll have to see. Um, but clearly, given the sums of money that Welsh Government have been recently announcing as available and released, it's perfectly plausible that we could receive that sum in addition. The way Welsh Government are going to play it is we put this indicative claim in. They're going to wait until we get to the end of March and settle up finally with us in early May. And that's going to be a bit of a challenge for me because I normally get to an outturn position to determine the statement of accounts by mid-May as one of the authorities that goes particularly quickly a claim in arrears for March being finalised in May isn't helpful to my position um, in terms of certainty of some, but I am at least thankful that the Welsh Government's allowed us to put our accelerated claim in in advance. So you shouldn't assume we're going to get the full £5.3 million. Pounds. But it's important I give you a long list of the individual items that, that are in the mix. Um, other items that I did refer to as coming imminently when I came to scrutiny, but deferred until I'd formally briefed Cabinet on the 18th, was that the local government and housing minister had announced two further sums of money of £25 million each, totalling some £50 million. And, and strangely, those ones were not to be going, going through the, what I refer to pejoratively as the beauty parade, where you've got to uh, compete against 21 other authorities. Those are both due to be allocated on a pro rata fair share basis. So I anticipate getting £3.75 million. You'll notice again I say anticipate because I don't as yet have the cash. It's due imminently, but I'm anticipating about 3.75 million for that. And the local government and housing minister also announced a 42 and a half million pound extension of the hardship fund to include covering free school meals up to the Easter holidays, which takes us to you know the end of March, early April um, of, and our share of that would probably be another three million pounds. In addition, we had separately, not related to the revenue budget, but related to the capital budget, we had an indication that there was a £50 million schools capital fund. And our share of that is between 3.6 and 3.7 million pounds. And we've been given our formal notification of that. Now, that's a typical one that has to be spent in years. So what we have to do is we have to find alternative spend to substitute the grant for and then give a personal guarantee to the Welsh Government that we will put the same amount in in the following year. It's not unusual. We've, we've done this in previous years with schools capital. We've done it previously with some schools revenue, and we often have to do it with a number of the place-based grants right at the end of the year. It's designed to wash the money through, but make sure there's no overall substitution. Um, so those are the ones that I'm aware of in terms that have affected affect us. I did indicate that when I came to scrutiny and also to cabinet, that the third quarter was before the, um, um, fourth quarter impacts of the business grants due to fire break and lockdown and I'd indicated there'd be at least 15 million pounds worth of additional business grants to be expensed through in the fourth quarter um, if and we'll wait and see what happens at the end of this week the first minister announces um, some relaxations but not sufficient relaxations for us to be fully open it is likely there'll be a second tranche of business grant money I can't speculate as to timing or amounts but by way of context 
as I say, the first one that I know I'm going to expense through in the fourth quarter is another £15 million. So it would be perfectly reasonable to assume that if there are two lots, it could be as much as £30 million. Quid. And you recall that's one that goes in and out. It's money that comes to us. We pay it to businesses, so it's no gain to us. And finally, whilst it won't affect the third quarter or the outturn, you will have all noted in addition that there is a £206 million extension of the hardship fund for the first six months of next year. That is important because it's context for things that are going to tweak the budget you've, that council has just set in the new year. I don't think the tweaks will be of the same order of magnitude. You know, you've seen £100 million worth of business grants, £35 million worth of NNDR relief, and you're going to see some substantial sums washing through in the new year. And that was all before the £735 million Barnet consequential to the Welsh Government, which will come in the new year. Um, so it's it's a really difficult time in terms of, I think you you rightly, Chair, referred to our Cabinet as a movable feast and a living document, and it still remains that. Here we are with three weeks of the financial year to go, and I've just had my final third quarter bit settled up, and I'm telling you, I'll know the fourth quarter outcomes in early May, which frankly is a little bit too late because I like to close early for authorities that take longer through to September to close. I don't think that May deadline causes them any sort of problem. And I just wanted to give you a bit of a flavour of, of what was still to come. And one of the things I wanted to emphasise, which hopefully came across in council last week, was that you could only make decisions on the things you knew about. We don't know what our share of the 206 million hardship fund is. We don't know what our shares of the new business grants are. We don't know what our share of the Barnet consequential coming down the 735 million pounds will be. What I am clear is they will all be administered as specific grants outside of um, block grant. And then the final one, which again is just stretching the timeline a little bit, you'll be aware that when we set the budget last week, that included um, assumptions over aggregate external finance. The Welsh Government is only going to debate its own budget this week and had already set the final settlement, which included what is called aggregate external finance. That's revenue support grant and NNDR combined. And you will be aware in last week's budget, the Chancellor announced a business rates relief holiday in England and the Welsh Government has announced a variation on a theme, which again guarantees a bit like in this year. And the reason I'm emphasising it is when you get the monitoring reports in the year, especially for Councillor Paxton Hood Williams, he will note yet again that we've, we will see major swings between what was expected in NNDR redistributed through AEF and what we actually get, because I'm expecting an awful lot of them to be expensed as specific grants again. Long and laboured, but I think it's important because in an, any normal year, if there is such a thing, the Treasurer are rocking up and saying, don't worry about it, it's only going to move by 60 or 70 million pounds, but it's much better than the near 150 to 200 million pounds of the last year. Um, would probably have you all with your heads in your hands. It's, it's had me with my head in my hands at times, but it's just symptomatic of where we are. There is going to be a ripple effect into the new year. And I thought it was appropriate that I give you the maximum amount of information that I could give you to prepare you for what you're going to get when you see the in-year monitoring reports in due course. I will pause there. I think that's all I need to say, other than that clearly I'd, I'd given you advice at the time in terms of what how how much we'd closed the gap. So I won't repeat the officer advice I gave last time, but as you can work out with those large sums of money I've referred to, they're all in the order of millions and they're all going the right way, which can only mean that the outturn is going to get better. I will pause there, Chair. Okay, Jeff Jansen, got your hand up. Yeah, I put my hand up. I just wanted to declare an interest really. Um, I know Ben actually uh, mentioned it when he was speaking there with the School Capital Fund. My, it mentions Hendra Oil and School in uh, item appendix C, sorry, item seven. Um, as I said, my my grand one of my grandchildren is actually in Hendra Oil and School. Um, but really, perhaps to ask a question, not, not a question, just a comment. I think um, in a meeting, Ben, you probably remember it better than I do recently. You actually said the uh, the local authority is awash with money at the present time. So is it related to this sort of thing? You know, you've actually used the word unusual as well. Well, it is extremely unusual. All these grants and funds actually coming through, especially at such a late stage. So are we in a in a very good position financially? Uh, yes, you will require I me. Mean, I think I'll answer that three ways. Um, a wash with cash in cash terms, yes. Again, you will have heard advice from me before. You mustn't confuse cash with resource cover, the different things. The amount of cash flow you've got versus what you need to expense your future revenue costs. Um, yes, the whole raft of things. I mean, I came before this panel last time and I said with the leader in attendance that, you know, we were 
We had three days of notifications, each one of over three million pounds a day of money announced in February. That sort of pace has continued into March with the school's capital money, with the shares of new hardship extensions and also with the new money coming into the new year. So, um, yes, that very much does improve the position. And of course, you are well aware that we outturned with a very significant underspend in 1920. So whilst at the very beginning of the year when this authority was faced with expensing large sums of money with no certainty as to what it was getting back from Welsh Government, we have continued to get the majority of the sums back from Welsh Government and as we've got nearer and nearer and nearer to year end, we have seen the pace and scale and frequency of those announcements really up the ante and that has undoubtedly improved the position significantly from each of the quarters and this is um, a, an unusual year beyond all unusual years where you have got to strip out those COVID effects um, and there's an, an enormous timing issue. I mean I've been consistent throughout the year I've been telling you that first quarter well you'll know by September which is pretty rubbish in a normal year um, but it's just the nature of you having to wait two or three months for getting certainty of sums but as a treasurer I'm never going to be disappointed to get more cash back in those claims than I had anticipated in the first, second and third quarters, Councillor Jones. OK, uh, Councillor Peter Blair. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, ben, I, I, obviously everything is still very uncertain and we don't know how much we're getting back from the Welsh Government. But am I to take it from the general gist of your comments that you're expecting another underspend by the end of the year, given the, the sums which we bid for and which look, look likely to come in? That That is correct, Councillor Black. I think, as you, as you rightly say, whilst they're not certain, the order of magnitude, I've rattled off five, six items, which are all probably fair shares of at least £3 million each, given where we were at the formal third quarter, it would be astonishing if we didn't end up with an outturn underspend. And where would that money then be put? Just into general reserves or, or uh, which, as you keep telling us, need propping up or, or, or earmarked reserves? Uh, then that that would be a decision ultimately for members on my officer advice. As I indicated, I, I wasn't proposing for you when setting tax to increase general reserves, but I have given advice and at some point they'll need to tick up a bit. So that's one option. Um, they wouldn't need to go up materially, the general reserves, but they need to go up a bit. The majority of it would be into earmarked reserves. Um, and again, I'm sure, you know, as we had much debate last week and there will be much debate to come, um, a number of those earmarked reserves were set up because they bank short term gains, particularly from the capital financing jiggery pokery. And I am absolutely adamant that I will continue to give officer advice, which reminds you that any decisions that are taken, whilst legally, yes, you're only deciding for one budget at a time at council, must have due regard to previous decisions that were taken, which have locked in very, very substantial capital spending for which not all of it has yet been borrowed nor financed. So, so looking a few months ahead, um, the, the proposal we made at Council to take money out of earmarked reserves to keep the council tax down may well be more sustainable than it seemed at the time. <laughs> you... <laughs> A a anything is possible, but I continue to give the officer advice I give, which is we're uncertain as to what we've got, and I would like to con conclude what we've got when we've got to outturn. The other thing I would say is that I'm going to stick to my officer advice. It won't surprise you, Councillor Black. The Chief Exec and I were quite adamant. The outlook for public sector finances, which has only been confirmed by national commentators, yeah. is bleak. It is bleak. And so taking money out, budgeting to take money out is less sustainable than doing it when you know you've got it with certainty. And I was having a view over the medium term and the longer term, and I'm going to continue to stick to that advice. I will remind all members of all political parties that the money is not there just for one off reductions in council tax. My issue was it was a one off proposed reduction in council tax because once you've set it in the budget, it's really difficult to unwind it. But you're absolutely right. With the benefit of hindsight, when we get to outturn, it's perfectly plausible you could turn around and say, told you so. Paxton Hood Williams. Well, Peter, <laughs> you Chairman, um, I know I've got to be careful because the last time I got accused of playing politics here, but I'll try and avoid doing that this time. But there we go. Um, can I just go back to uh, Appendix A for the moment on page 37? 
Uh, <coughs> we're still looking there, uh, Ben, in terms of taking four million out of your mark reserves. Are you anticipating from what you said now that that four million is not going to be required? It's the first question, basically, I guess. Yep, absolutely. You can conclude exactly that. The position at the third quarter required that draw. Given, as I've indicated, I listed five or six items, all of which are worth three or four million pounds. It is a, a racing certainty that that will not be needed, which sort of follows on, I think, from where Councillor Peter Black was rightly asking me the questions be, be, beforehand. But I do make a distinction between budgeting and what we actually get. It's been a very, very uncertain year, and most of these are not yet assured. But I think given the value of each of them, and there's five or six pots, all of three, four million pounds, um, if I were a betting man, um, you'd expect at least one or two of the GGs to come in, wouldn't you? So yes, in it, reality, it must it must remove the, the the anticipated draw when the third quarter report was written in December. So you're looking to anticipate in about 17, 20 million of that sort of order, I guess, in terms of what you're saying. I'm um, not going to answer that on the basis that is speculation. That makes an assumption that all the GGs are coming in. I don't know which ones will, but you are cer I'm certainly happy to give officer advice that it would be a material figure. All right, if it's. If it, if it might be an optimistic figure, but we can add that to the 12 million effectively already that we are <coughs> uh, net beneficiaries from Welsh Government according to quarter three. That's the figures there quite clearly between the 74 and 122 that you've got about uh, a third of the way down and uh, then the loss of money in terms of uh, rates so that comes out about 12 million so we're looking at about 30 million at the end of the day i suppose coming to uh <coughs> well, 35 million if you want to be really optimistic coming to swansea from cardiff which has received 6.2 billion pounds so it's a very small percentage i guess I and mean, that's all the point i want to make it is a very small percentage but it'll be interesting to see how that's justified at the end of the day I will come back in, Chair, but I will deliberately avoid answering the political connotations just at the end. The rest of it, I think Councillor Patrick Williams has perfectly reasonably set out. Yes, I think it is likely. I mean, I mean, the figures, don't forget that the expensed costs above, so you can't just take the 74 less the 122. The 74 million is money we've handed out to businesses. We've also spent 30 million quid on our own services, which has got to be deducted off that 122 and the figure down below. But I think you're right, the Welsh Government have distributed very substantial sums to all 22 authorities um, and um, with the benefit of hindsight but I'm in the same position as every treasurer at first quarter when I had no guarantee of getting any money back you saw a very large projected overspend and then you've seen it come Indeed. rapidly in and at third quarter it's down to because frankly four million quid at third quarter on a half billion pound net budget is a rounding error and as you've rightly worked out as of other members uh, we are likely to um, be in an underspend position. I, as I say, I can't. I, I don't want to be drawn on an amount. You've you've speculated as to an amount. Uh, it's an amount that could come to pass, um, but it's certainly going to be very material. Thank you, Ben. Okay, I'll leave it there, Chairman. Okay, Ben. I I have a, a, one question really, and that's on item four in this, and that's the revenue budget summary. Yeah, I'm just uh, going to it, check. Yep. Fire away. If you look at that, the, the summary service forecast overspend was 17 million, shortfall of council tax was three, and then you had some mitigating circumstances. The one that um, I think needs to be pointed out is a contingency fund not currently utilised of 5.9 million. Correct. Now then, that contingency fund given the fact that what you've just said about the funding levels, um, why are we taking money out of the contingency fund or is it because of cash flow? Uh, what you've got to remember is this report was written at the third quarter before I've just rattled that. through six yeah. items which are worth, as Paxton, Councillor Paxton Hill Williams has alluded to, if they all came in, are worth 20 million quid. At the point of writing the third quarter, to balance off, I had to commit it. But you're absolutely right, Councillor Holly, to work out that that may not equally all be needed as a result of the very substantial sums that have been announced. As a treasurer defending um, 
Swansea's overall position and the overall cash for Swansea taxpayers, I'm never going to be disappointed about getting more back than I got, but I have to be prudent in the first instance. So at the point of writing the report, we had none of it. Getting five or six announcements for three, four million pounds a pop, great. Um, I'd have preferred to have known them earlier, but uh, I'll take them every which day of the of, of, of the week, to be honest, Councillor Holly. But you're absolutely okay, so right to them. work out that, uh, yeah, it, all, all of those help. It wasn't for cash flow particularly. It was drawn for cash flow in the short run, but it now looks like we won't need all of that. But we'll see what comes to final outcome. Right, all. Thank you. Anybody else? Any questions on this item? No? Then, yeah. yeah. Sorry, who's that? Oh, Me, Jeff. Jeff, 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 Jeff. Yeah, it's, it's, sorry, Ben, do actually, you know, the, um, the capital finance charges or the financing charges, it's quite a reduction. Uh, from uh, 36 million down to, sorry, 38, is it 30, no, 28 million, from 36 million down to 28 million. Um, I think you actually mentioned, you know, some of this is actually due to the MRP and so on. Um, you know, looking over the longer term, you know, this is going to, you know, the MRP is going to go from a positive to a, to a negative anyway. Um, and, you know, with a capital equalisation reserve, we're actually, uh, shall we say, helping or aiding to actually pay the, the financing charges anyway. Um, I know it's very difficult to forecast and so on, but with the extra borrowing that we're going to have to have over the next few years, um, with the, uh, the turn to negative plus these additional costs, we're actually going to end up with a capital financing charges of probably 38 to 40 million pounds with nothing really other than expected revenue streams to actually um, come or you know comfort that increase is that right or wrong or again you're right to say it's very difficult to know exactly what the figure would be and um, i've done my best in terms of the advice i've given in the mtfp around the stepped increases if you look at the mtfp that went to council last week it wasn't materially different to the previous year's mtfp which sets out many 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 millions of additional costs going on to capital financing as a result of the consequence years ago at council by majority to agree to spend 180 million pounds of additional borrowing for which there was no revenue support. Um, so you're, you're absolutely right, it's going to go up. I've given advice here and to cabinet and to council. And the reason that in the short run, and you're absolutely right, Councillor Jones, as you're well aware, the MRP is currently beneficial to us. It's a zero sum game, longer term it reverses. So you, at the moment you get the double benefit and then later on, when you've got to finance the entire capital programme, you've also got to meet the higher MRP cost. You are well aware, as I've given advice on both the Cabinet Council and here, and we'll talk about it again when we come to the Treasury Management Strategy. This council committed to that 180 million. I've only ever borrowed 90. The other 90 has to happen. Yeah. And we don't know what interest rate I'll get on the pool rate, but the interest rate alone you know, at several percentage points, it's going to be millions of pounds. So I, I, one thing I wanted to make sure was that whilst budget is set in isolation and the MTFP is considered over a five year period, I always have given advice, which is reminding council of the 50 year consequence, because you'll recall back three years ago when that two, three years ago when the MRP review came in, I set out the full 50 year consequence. Now, again, yeah. it will move a bit over time, but it's broadly right. It was my best assumption mm -hmm. at the time. And the advice I've given to Cabinet Council and here, um, and I'm going to repeat it again, is an awful lot of those savings are temporal. They are temporary. Yeah. We haven't yet borrowed all the money. We are currently benefiting from a lower MRP. We know at some point we will borrow all the money. We know at some point the MRP will reverse. And the further joker in the pack is, as I, as I advised, at, when you, at your at, um, regeneration scrutiny panel, Councillor Jones, um, I'm factoring in the net cost after taking into account the city deal financing. And as you'll be aware, last week, the Chancellor announced his intention to accelerate forward the financing for the city deal from a 15 year programme to a 10 year programme, which means for five more years we get a lower net cost but it will drop out quicker at the end and i need to make yeah. sure i've got money for the whole of the life cycle what i don't have even though the, the the budget was last week even in the detail of the red book it's a very very 
bland statement as to what is being done. It's obvious as to what the effect is in terms of bringing it from a 15 to a 10 year deal. Mm -hmm. But there are as yet no specific sums attributed to each of the individual partners. So again, I've had to make assumptions over what will benefit the authority for the next seven years. Note seven years, because that's what the timeline is, i.e. the whole of the next MTFP, which council agreed last last week. But eventually, when you get after year seven, that drops out and that will add a further burden to the capital financing. And that was the main reason for my giving the advice in that I know it's tempting to draw money from the capital equalisation reserve. Um, I am giving you councillors as a whole advice, reminding you that the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act obligations requires you to, yes, make a decision on the council tax today. And I get entirely people are under pressure financially, but making sure you've got sufficient to fund it over the life cycle. OK, and, and going back to the capital equalisation reserve, we're able to put quite large sums of money into it at the present time. Is that forecast to actually continue? I, I keep continuing to give officer advice to council. Council approves the statement of accounts. The officer advice I will continue to give is that if there is a temporal underspend on capital financing as a result of me deferring borrowing and because of the slippage on the capital programme and because of the short term beneficial impact of the MRP saving, if there are savings that accrue as a result of capital financing, my officer advice will continue to be to add it into the capital equalisation reserve. Uh, I've given advice previously where I anticipated that the peak borrowing would be in 25-26 and you'll be aware that's why I gave officer advice to extend an extra year into the MTFP. Uh, until I get the full detail, I can't be certain, but my, by my reckoning, the accelerating forward of the city deal money over a seven year timeline makes us benefits us in the short run and probably means it will now peak in 28, 29, 2028, 29. So I've got to make sure there is sufficient in that reserve to last all the way through to 2028, 20, 29. If it is taken before then for purposes other than smoothing the capital financing, it will run out. Um, you will also have noted in the budget proposals that there was a commitment to fund the school's ICT reserve, and that is also funded by money from the capital equalisation reserve. So there are commitments being made, and one of the things that I'm legally obliged to do is to make sure that when council makes decisions to commit money, so committing £180 million worth of borrowing under the old envelope, a, 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 a um, uh, approval was given to the capital programme to add an additional £20 million worth of unsupported borrowing and also a commitment was given to fund effectively over the next 10 years because it was 700 grand in next year, £7 million worth of schools ICT replacement. So yes, that capital equalisation reserve will be sitting there and yes, it is likely in the short run to still have sums being added to it and it will be very, very tempting to go after it as members. Members make the decisions, not me. I will be continuing to be very consistent in the officer advice I give that I was hoping that it lasted till 25, 26. I'm now expecting to give officer advice to say it's got to last to 28, 29. And um, you can uh, remind me of that if anyone, any, anyone of any persuasion tries to take money out of it for a reason other than for smoothing the capital financing costs. Because otherwise you're just going to get an enormous jump up. There's no point going flat, 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 and then say, you know, otherwise I'll be the sort of authority that turns up and says, oops, I forgot about the fact that capital programme costs meant that the advice I gave years ago was that you could expect your capital financing costs to go up by 50%. It would be remiss of me not to make sure you do it on a gradual glide path rather than just kick the can down the road and worry about it in 10 years time. So that's a very long answer, but I think you, I think you've all got the gist of it. I think you understand entirely the, the advice that I've given previously, Councillor Jones, yeah? Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I, th I think the, the, the issue really, Ben, is, isn't about uh, your your advice about how the, the you know what's putting into the capital equalization fund. I think the real issue is in the years that we are taking money out of revenue to put into it, we're also actually cutting services and 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 actually putting council tax up as well. And I think it's a balancing act between that. And I think that's what the issue is. Okay. Uh, any other questions on this now? Uh, if just not. Sorry. Just on, a technical, just on a technical matter, Chairman, in that sense, the faster we get the money in through, <coughs> from governments in terms of the city deal also has a, a slight impact, doesn't it, 
Ben, in terms of discounted cash flow considerations, that money that you've got now is worth more than it is in 10, 20, 30 years time. And also, so that's a benefit as far as we are concerned. And that's one of the advantages you have of smoothing out the payments as well that you did the, I can't remember the technical term of it that you did a couple of years ago now. But it does all recognise the fact that uh, <coughs> the more money you've got now, the better it is that you can, than having it in the future. Most, well, most definitely the case. Point. Yeah, a absolutely the case in twofold. Yes, it improves on the cash flow, which you're quite right, Councillor Paxton Hood Williams improves it from the overall discounted cash flow. But also having the money up front and having it on an accelerated basis does enable some substitution around what the overall capital capital financing cost should be in any individual year. So you will see that the net effect of the proposals that were passed by Council last week were to set the capital financing charges for next year at exactly the same budgeted level as the current year, rather than have any of the stepped increase. And that's partly a consequence of uh, the, the fact that we are anticipating that the city deal money will be accelerated forward over seven years. What percentage share we'll get, we'll have to wait and see. But the Treasury's reference was it's an extra £5.4 million a year to the Swansea Bay City deal. That will be for the city region to decide how to allocate. But Swansea was due about 20% of the share. So 20% of £5.4 million is £1.1 million straight out the base budget for at least seven years. But in homage equally to what Councillor Jones has said, it's quite right that after those seven years are burnt through, because this is equally a zero sum game, the step up then comes. So I may have to change the angle of the glide path, but you're absolutely right, Councillor Paxton Hall Williams, and I absolutely acknowledge as an officer that it's clearly beneficial for me to have the cash and the resource cover earlier. And this was movement by the UK government. The Welsh government had already accelerated theirs a bit, but it is clearly beneficial to the authority. OK. Right. Can we then go on to go back to to item six and take item six and seven together, uh, and that's the midterm budget statement and the technical management uh, strategy statement. Okay. Everybody happy? Right. Ben, over to you. There's little I want to say to the two reports in themselves because they are the reports, and as I somewhat uh, jokingly at the end of council debate last last week indicated that if, even I'd lost the will to live to to talk through the detail of them. But I meant what I said in terms of that officer advice, which is whilst they're quite dry and boring, they're very, very important. They set out the long term capital financing strategy. They set out all the parameters. If you read the reports carefully, I do accept they've got horrible technical mumbo jumbo in them, but it sets out very, very clearly those capital financing requirements over the longer term which make quite clear that they're going to accelerate very rapidly in the HRA, but logically so because the HRA is done it is doing large revenue supporting of the overall capital programme to support the Welsh housing quality standard. Um, and that you see equally that some, you know, some of you will be alarmed at the size of the capital financing requirements set out in those two reports. You know, they go up by hundreds of millions of pounds. They should go up by hundreds of millions of pounds because council agreed an extra £180 million borrowing envelope, which as a result of last week added another £20 million to it. So they should go up by hundreds of millions of pounds. But equally, you'll see that they, they're, they're measured as a percentage of the revenue budget. Effectively, it was one of the tests that's applied to see can you afford it? And when you see those percentages, they go up a little bit and then they start to drop down a bit. As I indicated with the revenue budget and the MTFP last week at council, in every scenario, I see budgets going up. Part of the wider policy debate um, is um, cash budgets are likely to go up in the public sector, but commentators are indicating that if you're not a protected department, you can expect them to go down in real terms in the medium term. So there are some complex interplays and the reports um, set out all of the assumptions, particularly emphasising the longer term nature of the decisions that are being made and set out fully and clearly um, the decisions taken on MRP. And without those reports, I have no authority to transact uh, the Treasury management activity and the borrowing activity on your behalf in year. And you'll be amazed how many times they wash through in a year. So, you know, we're a half billion pound net authority, but you could see transactions in total of over a billion pounds in a year as money comes in and out because we on lend the cash to make very modest interest. And equally, the reports make quite clear the long term strategy is um, 
I have to externalise the rest of the debt. I can't carry on for forever spending what was 180 million pounds of borrowing now 200 million as a result of last week's council and only actually having got 90 million pounds away. As sure as eggs is eggs, the rest is going to be externalised. The issue is, when do I externalise it? And as I indicated at council last week, I'd love to have externalised it already because I can see bond yields going up a bit, but I'm not allowed to. As I won't repeat what I said in terms of council advice. Um, I am restricted and I may not borrow in advance of need. I will want to borrow as soon as possible because I, you know, because e everything I've said about all those assumptions in the MTFP are on the basis that I can still get away at relatively historically low interest rates. And they are still relatively low, but you may have seen there was a tam temper tantrum like uh, end of last week in the States with bond yields and they have gone up markedly inside the last month. And there are now economic commentators in the UK that are concerned in similar vein that there is a risk that inflation will tick up. There is a risk that interest rates will tick up. Um, and clearly, if the, if the bottom of the curve has been achieved, I will want to externalise it as quickly as possible. But rest assured, at the point at which I externalise it, you are then you get the benefit of locking in at the historically low rate, but you're also locking in the obligation for me to make full minimum revenue provision for it in year and to service that debt. So you've had three years now of me sitting on the sidelines, timing one of the 90 million pounds really, really well, waiting for the 1% premium to drop out, which now has. I can't borrow it this year. I can't borrow until next year. But when I do borrow it, you, you can be guaranteed that those capital financing costs will go up. So you will not you will not get a repeat. Whilst last year you had an eight million pound underspend on capital financing, and at the moment you've got the same in the current year, you cannot rely on that for forever because I will have to externalise the debt. And I would have loved to have already externalised it, but I'm not allowed to at the moment. As soon as I'm able to, I will do because I want to lock in um, at, at, at reasonable rates. And as I, I, I finish with what I said at council, which is well, whilst they're dry and technical documents, get these wrong as a treasurer, and you very, very rapidly run out of revenue resource cover. There are authorities whose names I will not name, but there are authorities that have ended up with claiming they can get away with an MRP of naught. There are authorities that claim that they can have an MRP, which is less than the profits they make on development companies. And oops, they've gone. They're not allowed legally to be bust, but you'll be well aware. I think we're now up to seven MHCLG actual capitalization directions issued. The Croydon one has also been issued, but is not yet public domain. Um, and uh, as was referred to last week, there's about 12 that sit for expecting there to be capitalization. And these are authorities that have ended up running out of revenue cover and have had to go cap in hand to the UK government. Um, now, it's not free money. It comes with bailout conditions and, and local taxpayers have to ultimately pay for it. But as I say, get get these get these reports wrong and they go wrong very, very rapidly. I mean, in one sense, you sort of think, you know, I mean, I joked last week, didn't I, at council? You know, I went for a nice, easy life. I decided not to be a lion tamer. I'd do a bit of public sector finance as a, as a local authority accountant. And the revenue budgets are not that complicated. They become complicated if there's no money coming in in block grant and your inflation costs are rocketing away. But the one thing that is deeply, deeply complicated is financing the long term capital programme and some of the trickery around it. And I know we've 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 done it in light hearted jest, haven't we, Councillor Holly and others, where it's the, you know, the dark arts of the treasurer. And, the, and it's undoubted the case. Elements of it are the dark arts. Some other treasurers have gone for the dark arts and claimed that they could m magic away the costs for forever. And shock horror, it doesn't quite work that way. You you can you can do things that change the timing and profiling, but those that have tried to be very, very clever seem to have got themselves in an awful lot of difficulty. And that is the main reason for me being quite robust in the officer advice I will continue to give. Um, I'm plain speaking and I'll continue to be plain speaking to councillors of all parties. And I will be reminding of those longer term obligations. You are making decisions as councillors as a whole in council and committing to money that's going to be on taxpayers for 50 years. Uh, I will always have to give officer advice to remind that you can't view it in isolation over one year. It's really difficult even to view it over the, the, the MTFP. This council is borrowing more money through unsupported borrowing than it's ever borrowed. You, you, you're all well aware of that. 
and I set out the officer advice. So I will continue to labour the point. And it's this sort of document that tries to play it as long as it can without trying to give you a 50 year forecast. Because, I mean, at the moment, as you heard with my third quarter update report, I may as well have it on Velcro It change within two nanoseconds. But these are very, very important reports. I've nothing else particularly to add. Um, chair but i wanted to emphasize some of the context because i think the context is important but i'm more than happy to attempt to answer questions on what are undoubtedly very complex reports right any questions from any members first no well, ben i got i got quite a number of questions but also uh, uh, some issues um on Appendix 4 of Item 6 is the table of prudential indicators. Uh, just to confirm that the um, general fund capital expenditure from the outturn in 1920 was 74 million, and the original estimate for 2021 is now 115 million. Uh, that, that is the general requirement. It then goes down to capital finance requirement. Um, the outturn in 2019-20 is 364.6 million, and the original estimate was 471. Why is this such a huge difference, Ben? Can't you, you, you muted? I'm struggling to get the IT to work. I'm having the same issues as before, so I haven't actually got to the page you're referring to, Chair. Because so I'm trying to, as ever, do two things at once with limited connectivity. So I'm trying to get to the right page on report six. Yeah, it's page eighteen of twenty-two. Oh. Now I'm gonna have to switch to the other machine. Apologies. Sorry, Chair. Yeah, page 18, I've got it now. Sorry about the technical difficulties there. You see, the outturn was 74 million, but the original estimate was 115 million on the capital expenditure. Yeah. And even for us, that's a lot, um, but that's on the outturn. And then you have the capital financial requirement was 364, and yet the, out, uh, the original estimate was 471. That's a huge difference. Uh, it, it, it is, and it's a direct consequence. 2019-20 outturn was the capital programme for 1920. The capital yeah. programme agreed for 2021 included the bulk of building out the arena and yeah. the stuff around it, and of course was also turbocharged by the um, field hospital. Yes. Um, so in the revenue monitoring and capital monitoring where i've indicated you know we're, we're talking about an outturn on capital of over 200 million pounds in the year that's mm. in, in in previous years when i've come to this panel you know we've we've had a capital program and hope to get nearly the to the 100 million pounds worth of outturn yeah. so it, it's an inevitability you're quite right chair it it demonstrates the sheer amount of capital spend that is underway and the sheer amount of capital borrowing that needs to be done. They are very, very substantial increases. It's the very reason why I worry about the longer to medium to longer term in terms of giving advice to make sure that I, because I, I'm not worried about financing it in 2021 or 21, 22. I'm looking to 25, 26 with the reprofiling with City Deal. I'm now looking to 28, 29, and I will continue to remind I'm also worried about 68, 2068 69 because we're borrowing it for 50 years i think yes. it's right to borrow it for 50 years because a the yield curve is attractive and b we're building assets that we think will last a good 40 50 years but you're absolutely right they do leap off the page they are very very large numbers i'm not surprised because it gives effect to what council a majority of council members agreed when council set the budget in the mtfp in previous years they're absolutely off the richter scale absolutely chair yeah, as expected but then I come down to the capital financial requirement, which is currently the outturn was 364 million and now is 471 million. Is that the consequence of last uh, Thursday's 
extra 20 million on the 90 or is that what the original estimate of the the 200 million that we were borrowing back in 2017 yeah that's only the original estimate that that that, that, that this, is this, is, this is the in-year report so this is before the decision to stretch the envelope by a further 20 million pounds 200 million oh yeah the 20 million right yeah the extra 20 so then, yeah, so it it now comes the upper limit for fixed interest rate exposure under the tre Treasury management potential indicators. We now up to one hundred percent. We we always set it at a hundred percent. When we set a budget, we set yeah. it at one hundred percent. The outturn will deviate from that. So I think we had the similar questions it, last it, time. We we are still setting it at one hundred percent. Correct. So then we then will have to determine well i should imagine it'll be in the next budget what percentage of that will will have been done yeah well, i mean ne next time round, when we set an upper limit for fixed debt it will again say for setting the budget it will be assumed it's 100 percent fixed because i'm borrowing from pwlb but in the short term if i'm not borrowing the money and i've got borrowings to and fro between individual authorities they're at potentially variable sh variable rates in the short term so the budget is always set an assumption of up to 100 percent it's an upper cap so some authorities choose to say, no, you can't borrow more than 80 percent of your money as fixed money. Um, you've got to make a decision as to do you think interest rates are going to go up or down? It will come as no surprise that I'm going with 100 percent fixed because I still think fixed rates for 50 years are very, very attractive money. Why would I go and do temporary short term borrowing at variable rates when I think we're already at still? I know the curve's gone up a little bit, but I still think we're at the bottom end. So it's permission for me to borrow ev up to everything being fixed rather than some at variable rate. And again, without naming individual authorities, some went for some of the cleverer ones or thought they were cleverer, different to the ones I've already named. They went for a strategy of lots of it at variable rates and they can't frankly afford the 50 year rates. Yeah, and then and on that on that level, when we take money, uh, the capital capital money that we've put aside, uh, the the cost of the capital, the revenue cost of the capital. If we don't use it, we put it into this equalisation fund. If we hadn't put it into that fund, it would have gone to the revenue account, as prior to 2017, but much smaller amounts because prior to 2017, the equalisation fund could be about a million. We're now talking in in some years of 12 million. So effectively, what I'm saying is, whereas in the past we have used, we've put money back, or we haven't used money in the equalisation fund, we've left it there. Now we're using it as a, a earmarked reserve where it used to be part of revenue, and it's still part of revenue, but it's now put into that fund and indicating the fact that indicators how much will that affect our indicators in the future in other words we have now got a, a earmarked reserve of 20 odd million pound to to use as a buffer uh, to pay for various capital projects how will that indicate within the prudential indicators will will our indicators go up or down or will we remain where we are as a, an authority with our rate rating as capable or incapable or whatever. So to answer that with a short answer first, and then you may want to come back further, the Treasury management policy statements set it ignoring the reserves figure. So if I have if if councillors agreed to borrow two hundred million pounds, you will see ultimately those operational boundaries for external debt over time go up by the full two hundred million pounds. And if they get stretched again, they'll go up by more. A decision to apply the reserve, because you're quite right, the reserve is revenue money, as, as we've discussed previously, because you borrow the money, you service the debt. The servicing of the debt is a revenue cost. And so um, it's expensed when it's expensed in terms of servicing the debt. And then when there's a draw from the reserve, it helps reduce the revenue cost to the revenue account. But it doesn't get netted off. It's not the same as our assumptions elsewhere. So the timing on the city deal money coming in, because again, that's equally complicated. The city deal money is a revenue grant to pay for the exactly. capital financing costs of capital. So these, these reports are always reported gross. 
So it's, it ignores the funding source because, again, the way the city deal is structured, it's the city and county of Swansea that goes out and borrows for its own schemes. So you borrow the gross cost. You will continue to report the gross cost in all of these, but the net cost may flow in the re will flow to the revenue account because you'll have the gross cost of servicing the debt taken on by the council minus the bits that come from other streams on an annual basis through the city deal or washed through in other ways through the UK and Welsh government. It's very, very complicated, Councillor Holly, but you're absolutely right. You've, 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 you've got it exactly right on that. But the important one for the panel to be aware of is these reports are always prepared gross. What am I actually going out and externally going to borrow? Mm. And it's always a frighteningly large number because I've broken the law if I exceed it. Yes. I, yes, I, I must understand. live within those parameters. So my well, officers I build on the basis think, yeah. of everything that we need to externalise. But you're quite right, as you've all alluded to, in the short term where I haven't actually gone out and externalised. So I've borrowed 90. I haven't borrowed the other 90 and I've yet to borrow the other 20. Well, that's what causes the revenue financing, capital financing to, to, to be beneficial in the short run, which goes into the reserve. So I'll pause there. I think I think you've. I think you've got the gist of that, Councillor Holly. Yeah, I, I, I understand. I just want yeah. the panel to understand that we've taken money out of our revenue account, stored it into a into a um, earmark reserve to smooth out uh, any further increase in the capital revenue cost. That that's as long as that's all OK by everybody, that's fine. Are there any other questions now for Ben? No, if that's the case, can I thank you? Um, I should call you Mr. Smith. No, I'll call you Ben. Uh, thank you very much, Ben, for your your um, your attendance here this morning, and thank thank you for your continuing patience with some of us. Thank you, Chair, and uh, and uh, likewise, I, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to explain. And and some of these some of these concepts are not easy. Uh, they they they're not. Um, and but I think the panel's got a good understanding of it as a council. It knows what it's decided to do. But I thank but you, I think, Chair Fruwards. You know, I think being here at the at the feet of a, a professor of the black arts is, is teaching us all, Ben. All joking okay. aside, I would want panel to understand as best as possible fully what it is. So I'm more than happy to to up to, to to answer any sort of questions. I'm more than happy to to explain it a number of times. It's really really complicated stuff. There aren't many people, who, you know, there aren't many people who understand it amongst my own staff. I mean, I, I have to broadly understand it. That's what I have experts for. It is very much in the very black art part of the black arts. I would agree with you entirely there, Councillor Holly. And I think okay. on that note, I will go, hey, presto, and disappear. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is the letters. See all the copy of the letters. Any questions or comments? Right, OK, the next item on the agenda is the works plan. Um, the work plan sorry, is being... Just come back to the letter a second. So, sorry, Peter, I didn't yeah. see your hand up. Yeah, no, I didn't put my hand up. I just realised I wanted to come back on something. Um, th what we asked the Cabinet member to look at um, was the performance monitoring of major planning applications which are approved. Yeah. That isn't what he answered. No, it isn't. But we, uh, I think, if you notice in the work plan, we have got the annual report for the planning department. Yeah. And I think we need to ask that question there, because I think we need a direct answer from the planning department on how the performance is related on things that have passed and not the actual applications. Yeah. I think that will see the gist of what we asked. Um, and we haven't had an answer on that. I mean, really, this isn't a planning thing. Oh, it, it's, a, it's a wider planning thing, isn't it? It's more an economic development thing. You know, are, are, we, are, we, are we monitoring um, developments in the city and, and how they impact on the economy? That's a fair comment, yeah. 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 OK. OK. Then if we can... Sorry, uh, if we then go on to the work plan, you will a couple of issues on there, and I think um, you notice there is a couple of issues there, medium term, which is we just had. We got the corporate complaints annual report, the planning annual performance report, and I think at that stage we may ask um, someone to come along 
from development as well to explain how planning performance is 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 achieved um and then the last one then is the welsh housing quality standards i think uh, um we need to explain that there's no performance monitoring now on it because after the last um, meeting with richard rowlands with regards to to the way in which uh, the performance was being related currently through the COVID-19. It became, if I'm honest with you, it became a bit of a farce because about there's only about four indicators couple in social services, which actually are any relevance at the moment because of COVID-19. So that that was that was the reason why. There is a couple of other things that um, obviously is is the review with the bylaws i'm going to go through that with emily over the next couple of weeks and then bring a report to the scrutiny board um there are hundreds of these and uh when i bring the report you'll see understand why we're going to categorize them in a certain way um now the overview of the scrutiny of the commission reviews and the outcomes is one which I know many of you have had that discussion about them, what has come out of that and what's been good and what's been bad. It's the, there is going to be an issue with that, and that was with the recovery plan. Um, and that's a discussion that we're going to have to have with Adam because the commissioning reviews in many ways are now going to come out, become out of date when you consider that the recovery plan is going to have a different emphasis and a different view on it to what the Commission and Reviews has done before COVID-19. Uh, and that and that is going to make us, I think, going to make a significant difference. But that discussion needs to be had with Adam. Um, management structure that um, I can't give you any details on that because I haven't been, haven't seen them yet. Um, and then the data action plan, which again is something which we have had in the past, but we haven't had any from for a couple of years yet. So any comments on the work plan? Anyone? No, no. OK, I'm going to stay on with Emily now and I'll have a discussion about meeting with them um, with uh, Adam to discuss the uh, the overview of the uh, commission and reviews and then also a discussion about a meeting about the bylaws. OK. If that's all, thank you all very much. Bye. Bye. Emily. Yeah.